questions to the Prime Minister. Chloe Smith. Number one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know the whole House will want to join me in wishing Wales luck ahead of the Euro 2016 semi-final this evening. They have played superbly and we wish them all the best. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Chloe Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am a Conservative because I believe it's not where you're coming from, it's where you're going. Yeah. 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 Does my right honourable friend well, agree? Well, Does my right honourable friend agree that the opportunity to succeed, no matter what your background, it's what we want for Britain. Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. Making sure that all our citizens have life chances to make the most of their talents should be the driving mission for the rest of this Parliament. Yesterday at Cabinet, we were discussing the importance of boosting national citizen service, which I think is actually going to play a key role in giving young people the confidence and the, and the life skills to make the most of the talents they undoubtedly have. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think today it would be appropriate if we paused for a moment to think of those people who lost their lives in the bombings in Baghdad and Medina in recent days, the, the people that have suffered and their families at the end of Ramadan. It must be a terrible experience for them, and I think we should send our sympathies and solidarity to them. I, I join with the Prime Minister in wishing Wales well. <laughs> and I will be cheering for Wales along with everybody else. That's quiet, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, ah, uh, oh, there is life after all. Um, Thirty years ago, Mr Speaker, the Shirebrook Colliery employed thousands of workers in skilled, well-paid, unionised jobs digging coal. Today, thousands of people work on the same site, the vast majority on zero-hours contracts, no union recognition, where the minimum wage isn't even paid. Doesn't Shirebrook sum up Agency Britain? Exactly. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me join the Leader of the Opposition in, in giving our sympathies and condolences to all those who have been the victims of these appalling terrorist attacks, as he says, in, in Baghdad, in Medina, but also uh, in Istanbul um, uh, as well. Uh, on the issue of uh, what has happened in our coalfield communities to see new jobs and new investment uh, come, we have made sure that there is not only now a minimum wage, but now a national living wage. And yes. He talks about one colliery. I very recently visited the site of the Grimethorpe Colliery, where actually there's now one business there, ASOS, I think, now employing almost 5,000 people. So we're never going to succeed as a country if we try to hold on to jobs of industries that have become uncompetitive. We've got to invest in the industries of the future, and that's what this government's doing. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the problem is that if you're on a zero-hours contract, the minimum wage doesn't add up to a living weekly wage. He must understand that. Could I take him northeast of Shirebrook to the Lindsay oil refinery? In 2009, hundreds of oil workers there walked out on strike because agency workers from Italy and Portugal were brought in on lower wages to do the same job. Just down the road in Boston, low pay is endemic. The average hourly wage across the whole country is £13.33. In the East Midlands, it's £12.26. In Boston, it's £9.13. Isn't it time the government intervened to step up for those communities that feel they've been left behind in modern Britain? Well, first of all, we have intervened with a national living wage. We have intervened with more fines against companies that don't pay the minimum wage. We have intervened for the first time, something that Labour never did, of actually naming and shaming the companies involved. Now, those interventions help and can make a difference, but the real intervention that you need is an economy that's growing and encouraging investment, because what we want are the industries of the future, and that's what you can see in our country, and that's why record numbers are in work. Two and a half million more people have a job since I became Prime Minister, and the British economy has been one of the strongest in the G7. Jeremy Corbyn. 
Mr Speaker, this government promised it would rebalance our economy. It promised a northern powerhouse. Yet half of 1% of infrastructure investment is going to the North East. London is getting 44 times more than that. Does he not think it's time to have a real rebalancing of our economy and invest in those areas that are losing out so badly? Well, I, I think he is talking down the performance of uh, parts of our economy that are doing well. If you look at the fastest growing part of our economy, it's been the northwest, uh, not the southeast. If you want to see where exports are growing faster, it's the northeast, uh, not London. There's a huge amount of work to do to make sure that we heal that north-south divide. And for the first time, we've got a government with a proper strategy of investing in the infrastructure and the training and the skills that will make a difference. For years, regional policy was just trying to distribute a few government jobs outside London. Now we've got a strategy that's about skills, that's about training, that's about growth, and it's delivering. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, the idea of this redistribution is very interesting because the investment in London is more than the total of every other English region combined. Does he not think these issues should be addressed? In March, the government um, government investment was cut in order to meet its fiscal rule. How does the Prime Minister think the economy can be rebalanced when investment is cut and what little investment remains reinforces the regional imbalances in this country? Uh, well, first of all, I think again he is talking down the North in the questions that he asked. The unemployment rate in the North West is lower than the unemployment rate in London. So I think actually his figures are wrong. But in terms of investment, yes, of course. Of course, we need to have the government investment, and we've got it in HS2, we've got it in the railways, the biggest investment programme since Victorian times, the biggest investment in our roads since the 1970s, but you can only invest if you have a strong and growing economy. And we know what Labour's recipe is, more borrowing, more spending, more debt, trashing the economy, which is what they did in office, and that's when investment collapses. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor finally did this week what the Shadow Chancellor asked him to do in the autumn statement and what I asked the Prime Minister to do last week, and abandoned a key part of the fiscal rule. We now know the deficit was supposed to vanish by 2015, won't even be gone by 2020. Isn't it time to admit that austerity is a failure and the way forward is to invest in infrastructure, invest in growth and invest in jobs? What he says is simply not the case. The rules we set out always had flexibilities in case growth didn't turn out the way. But the point I'd make to him, I would take... I would take his advice more seriously if I could think of a single spending reduction that he had supported at any time in the last six years. The fact is, this government and the last one, the coalition government, had to take difficult decisions to get our deficit under control. It's gone from 11% of GDP that we inherited, the biggest almost in the entire world, to under 3% this year. That's because of difficult decisions. And if he can stand up and tell me one of those decisions he supported, I'd be interesting to hear it. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, concerns about the fiscal rule and investment are obviously spreading on his own benches. The work and pension sector and business sector have seen the light. They now agree with my honourable friend, the Shadow Chancellor, in backing the massive investment programme we've been advocating. Isn't it time that he thanked the honourable member for Hayes and Harlington for the education work he's been doing in this House? Will he now confirm that the Chancellor's fiscal rule is dead? and invest in the North East, in Lincolnshire, in Derbyshire, all those places that feel, with good reason, that they've been left behind and the investment is going to the wrong places and they're ending up with few jobs on low wages and insecure employment to boot. Prime Minister. If the investment was going in the wrong places, we wouldn't see two and a half million more people in work and we wouldn't see a fall in unemployment and a rise in employment in every single region in our country. The only area where I think the right honourable gentleman has made a massive contribution is in recent weeks he's come up with the biggest job creation scheme I've ever seen in my life. Almost everyone on the benches behind him has had an opportunity to serve on the front bench. job creation schemes, it's been a bit of a revolving door. They get a job, sometimes for only a few hours, and then they go back to the back benches. But it's a job creation scheme nonetheless, and we should thank him for that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On a day when 
significant questions have been levelled at the collective decision-making of politicians, military leaders and intelligence services. Many of our constituents will be seeking reassurance that the lives of their loved ones were not given in vain and that the mistakes made will never happen again. Can I ask the Prime Minister, will he ensure that the lessons learned will be fully examined and acted upon so that there can never be a repeat of the tragic mistakes made over a decade ago? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm grateful to our honourable friend for his question. I can certainly give that assurance. We will have, I'm sure, plenty of time uh, this afternoon to discuss the Chilcot report, and Sir John Chilcot is on his feet at the moment uh, explaining uh, what he has found. I think the most important thing we can do is to really learn the lessons for the future. Uh, and the lessons he lays out quite clearly. We'll obviously want to spend a lot of time, I'm sure, talking about the decisions on going to war and all the rest of it. But I think for, the most important thing for all of us is to think, how do we make sure government works better, decisions are arrived at better, legal advice is considered better? All of those things, I think, are perhaps the, the, the best legacy we could seek from this whole series, so whole, whole, whole thing. Mr. Angus Robertson. Today is hugely important for Muslims at home and abroad at the end of Ramadan, and I'm sure we wish them all Eid Mubarak. Today is also a day where our thoughts are with all the loved ones who lost people close to them in Iraq and all of those hundreds of thousands of families in Iraq who also mourn loved ones. The Chilcot report confirms that on the 28th of July 2002, Tony Blair wrote to President Bush saying, I will be with you, whatever. Does the Prime Minister understand why the families of the dead and the injured UK service personnel and the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis feel that they were deceived about the reasons for going to war in Iraq? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, first of all, let me join the right hon. Gentleman in wishing uh, Muslims in this country and indeed all over the world Eid Mubarak at the end of um, Ramadan. Uh, in terms of the report, look, we're going to discuss it in detail uh, later, uh, and I, I don't want to preempt all the things I'm going to say I in my statement, but clearly we need to learn the lessons of the report. We should study it very carefully. It is millions of words, thousands of pages, uh, and I I think we should save our remarks for when we debate it in the House uh, after the statement. Mr. Angus Robertson. Mr. No, Speaker, the Chilcot report catalogues the failures in planning for post conflict Iraq and then concludes that, and I quote, the UK did not achieve its objectives. That lack of planning has also been evident in relation to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. to Libya, yeah. to Syria, and most recently with no plan whatsoever for Brexit. <laughs> when will the UK government actually start learning from the mistakes of the past so we're not condemned to repeat them in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, he's absolutely right that what Sir John Chilcott says about the failure to plan is, is very, very clear. And I can read from his statement because that's something that he has given. He says, when the invasion began, UK policy rested on an assumption that there would be a well-executed US-led and UN-authorised operation in a relatively benign security environment. Mr Blair told the inquiry that the difficulties encountered in Iraq after the invasion could not have been known in advance. He says, we do not agree that hindsight is required, and Sir John Chilcott is very, very clear on that point. What I would say to the right hon. Gentleman in terms of planning is what I put in place as Prime Minister following what happened in Iraq of a National Security Council, proper legal advice, properly constituted meeting, a proper meetings, a properly staffed National Security Secretariat, all those things, including the proper listening to expert advice in the National Security Council, all those things are designed to avoid the problems that, we, um, that, that the government uh, had in the case of Iraq. The only point I would make is there is actually no set of arrangements and plans that can provide perfection in any of these cases. Um, military intervention, we can argue whether it is ever justified. I believe it is. Uh, military intervention is always difficult. Planning for the aftermath of military intervention, that is always difficult. And I don't think in this House we should be naive in any way that there's a perfect set of plans or a perfect set of arrangements that can solve these problems in perpetuity. There aren't. Sir David Amis. Would my right honourable friend join me in congratulating South End Council, which is once again under the control of the Conservative Party? Yeah. Swiftly acting to sort out the mess left by the previous hopeless administration. Yeah. And would he agree with me that South End on Sea 
being the alternative city of culture next year will produce a considerable boost to the local economy. Well, well, let me pay tribute to my uh, honourable friend for his long-standing efforts to promote South End and all it has to offer. And while Hull is the official city of culture next year, I'm sure South End will benefit from the tireless campaign that he has run. And I certainly join him uh, in encouraging people to go and see this excellent seaside town for themselves. Dennis Skinner. Yeah. Yeah. Is the Prime Minister aware that two miles north of Shirebrook, already mentioned today, is a town called Bolsover, and they heard at the same time they were seeing the notices on the bus saying £350 million for the NHS, million pound for the NHS. At that time, they decided this government, with the help of the local people, to close the hospital at Bolsover. We need the beds. I'm sure he understands that. When the hospital is closed, it's gone forever. I want him here today to use a little bit of that money, yeah, not yeah, very yeah. much, to save the bulls of a hospital, save the beds, save the jobs. And the press might have a headline saying, the Prime Minister, Dodgy Dave, assist the beast to save the bulls of a hospital. What a temptation! <laughs> save it! The Prime Minister... First of all, I, I will look very carefully. I, I don't have the information about the exact situation at the Bolsover Hospital. I'll look at it very carefully and write to him. What I would say is that we are putting £19 billion extra into the NHS uh, in this Parliament. As for what was on the side of buses and all the rest of it, my argument has always been, and will always be, that it's a strong economy that you require to fund the NHS. Seema Kennedy. Last week, I held my first apprenticeships fair in my constituency. Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that apprenticeships are an absolutely vital part of economic development in our proud northern towns and cities? Yeah. 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 Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and that's why we've set the target for three million apprentices in this Parliament. I think it is achievable, just as we achieved the two million apprentices trained in the last Parliament. And I wish her well um, with what I hope is the first of many apprenticeship fairs in her constituency. Min Qureshi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I ask my question, can I thank the Prime Minister for the support he gave my campaign about getting an inquiry into the drug called Primados, which was given to pregnant women in the 60s and 70s, resulting in thousands and thousands of babies being born with deformities? And I'd like to thank him for that ca supporting that campaign. Mr. Speaker, my question is: Are universities are global success stories, outward-looking, open for business with the world? and attracting the brightest and the best students and researchers to produce groundbreaking research in areas from cancer to climate change. In the last year, the UK universities received 836 million. I want to take part, I need a single sentence question. Forgive me, but there are a lot of other colleagues who want to take part. Quickly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The universities received 836 million pounds last year. What assurances can the Prime Minister give us that, in, in light of the fact that we are now out of the European Union, that money will be saved? Yeah. Prime well, well, first of all, let me um, thank the Honourable Lady for her thanks, because she has raised this case of Primados many times. And I can tell her the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has been gathering evidence for a review by an expert working group on, on medicines, and they've met on three occasions. So I think we are making progress. The point she makes about universities, uh, until Britain leaves the European Union, we get the full amount of funding under the Horizons and other programmes, as you'd expect. All contracts under that have to be fulfilled, but it will be for a future government as it negotiates the exit from the EU to make sure that we domestically continue uh, to fund our universities in a way that makes sure uh, that they continue to lead the world. Thank you. Mr Kevin Foster. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As my right honourable friend will know, the potential closure of the BHS store in Torquay Town Centre with the loss of over 100 jobs has again raised the need for a major regeneration of town centres across the Torbay. Would, you, would my honourable friend outline what support will be made available by the government to ensure plans can be taken forward? Prime Minister. Well, well, first of all, it is worth making the point that it's a very um, sad moment for those BHS 
staff who've worked so long uh, for that business. For them, it wasn't uh, simply a high street brand. It was a job. It was a, a way of life. It was a means of preparing for their retirement and their pensions. And we must do all we can to help them and find them new work. And there are many vacancies in the retail sector, uh, and we must make sure they, they, they help, to help them to get those jobs. What we've done in terms of high streets is around £18 million has gone to towns through a number of initiatives, and we should keep those up because keeping our town centres vibrant is so vital. But this sits alongside the biggest ever cut in business rates in England, worth some £6.7 billion in the next five years. And I think we need to say uh, to those on our high streets to make the most of that business rate cut. Mary Black. One of my constituents who I've been working with for some time has had her mobility car removed after falling victim to a flawed PIP assessment by Atos. Now, after the involvement of my office, Atos have since admitted their error, and yet my vulnerable constituent still remains housebound and without a suitable car. Will the Prime Minister offer his full assistance to rectify this cruel situation, and will he look again at the regulations which allowed this situation to occur in the first place? Well, well, let me congratulate the Honourable Lady for taking up this constituency case. Many of us have done exactly the same thing with constituents who have had uh, assessments that haven't turned out to be accurate. I'll certainly, if she gives me the details, I'll look at the specific case and see what can be done. Kevin Hollinrake. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. A report recently commissioned by Transport for the North, a body created by this government, highlights the opportunity to halt the growing divide between North and South and create 850,000 new jobs and £97 billion of economic growth by 2050. Does my right hon. Friend agree that to build on our economic prosperity we need to continue to rebalance infrastructure spending from London to the regions, particularly to the north of England? Prime Minister. Well, I think my hon. Friend is, is absolutely right. Um, you know, what that report shows is that if we don't take the necessary actions, you're going to see a continued north-south divide, and that's why we are committed, for instance, to seeing increased spending on transport infrastructure go up by 50 per cent to £61 billion in this Parliament. And in my right hon. Friend's area, for example, we're spending £380 million upgrading the A1 from Leeming to Barton, which will be a big boost for the local economy. Chris Law. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, I recently met with Yemi, whose husband, Andy Segi, a British citizen, has been in Ethiopia's death row for over two years. Andy was kidnapped while travelling and illegally rendered to Ethiopia. He was sentenced to death six years ago at a trial that he was neither present at nor able to prevent any de- uh, present any defence whatsoever in direct contravention of international law. Given that he has been denied access to his wife and children, has spent a year in solitary confinement and has had no access to legal representation, recent reports suggest he is suicidal. Prime Minister, in your final weeks in office, will you finally demand the immediate release of Andy Segi and bring him home to be reunite- reunited with his wife and children? Well, what I can reassure the Honourable Gentleman about is that we're taking a very close interest in this case. Uh, the Foreign Secretary was in Ethiopia recently. Our Consul has uh, been able to meet with Mr Sege on a number of occasions, and we're working with him and with the Ethiopian Government to try and get this resolved. One of the reports that perhaps won't get so much attention is the CQC report into North Middlesex Hospital, which uh, confirms that uh, the emergency care is inadequate. Why has it taken so many years, and why does it need regulators to know what many of my constituents will know that there has been inadequate care for too long, too few doctors, too few consultants? Can the Prime Minister assure me that we now have in place the right plans and the right numbers of doctors and, and consultants to ensure that my constituents get the care that they deserve? Minister. Well, I think my honourable friend raises an important point, which is that I do think the CQC is now acting effectively at getting into hospitals, finding bad practice, reporting on it swiftly. In some cases, that bad practice has always been there, but we haven't been as effective as we should have been at shining a light on it. Now, what we've seen at North Middlesex is clearly one of the busiest emergency departments in the country. The practice was unacceptable. We've now got the appointment of a new clinical director at the Trust, additional senior doctors in place at A&E, and a change in governance. And under this government, it, we've been the ones that have set up the role of the chief inspector of hospitals, you know, to have a zero tolerance approach to practice like this and to make sure things are put right. Not in day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills has stated he wants the UK to borrow tens of billions of pounds to create a growing Britain fund worth up to 100 billion. Can I ask the PM whether this is a formal plan? or whether this is merely an attempt to conjure up a plan amid a leadership vacuum of the UK Government? 
Minister. Well, we are spending billions of pounds uh, on the British economy and on investment, as I've just shown, and that has clear consequences under the Barnet formula for Scotland. But clearly, my, my colleagues, uh, uh, during a leadership election, and at least at least on this side of the House, we're actually having a leadership election rather than sort of, you know, the, sort of the never-ending. Uh... So I thought you wanted one, or you don't want one. I don't... Hands up, who wants a leadership election? minute it's like the eagle is going to swoop and the next minute it's Eddie the eagle at the top of the ski jump not knowing whether to go or not. Anyway, in case you hadn't noticed we're having a leadership election. <laughs> right from the start this United Kingdom has been an outward looking international trading nation. I'm very glad to see the Trade Minister Lord Price. Sir, the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Worcester is entitled to be heard, and his constituents are entitled to be represented. The Honourable Gentleman. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, I'm glad to see the Trade Minister Lord Price out in Hong Kong today talking up the prospects for investment in the British economy. But what steps can the Prime Minister take to bolster the resources available to UKTI and the Foreign Office to make sure we attract as much trade and investment in the wide world as possible? Yeah. Prime Minister. Now, well, my Honourable Friend makes an important point, and a very clear instruction has gone out to all our embassies around the world, to UKTI, uh, and ministers are very clear about this, it is that we should be doing all we can to engage as hard as we can with other parts of the world to start to think about those trade deals, those investment deals and the inward investment we want to see in the UK. Business is very clear to us as well. Whether they agree or disagree with the decision the country has made, they know we've got to go on and make the most of the opportunities that we have. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With the real prospect of a recession on the horizon, the offer from the Chancellor is cutting corporation tax. Yet companies' worry is whether they will make a profit in the UK, not how much tax they are going to pay on it. So can the Prime Minister tell us what immediate action his government will take to protect people's jobs and livelihoods right now? Well, immediate action has been taken, not least the Bank of England decision to encourage bank lending by changing uh, the reserve asset ratios that they insist on. And I think that's very important because that's a short-term measure that can have some earlier effect. Clearly what the Chancellor was talking about is now we're in this new situation, we need to make sure that we configure all our policies to take advantage of the situation that we're going to be in. Now that's going to mean changes to taxes, it's going to mean changes to the way UKTI works, it's going to be a change in focus for the Foreign Office and the Business Department. All these things we can make a start on, irrespective of the fact that she and I were on the same side of the referendum campaign. Sir Gerald Howarth. Mr Speaker, further to my honourable friend uh, from Worcester's question about UKTI. May I remind uh, the Prime Minister that next Monday the greatest air show in the world takes place yeah, at yeah. Farnborough in my constituency, to which all honourable and right honourable members are expected to attend. <laughs> uh, and may I remind my right honourable friend that last time, two years ago, deals worth $201 billion were signed at the Farnborough air show. May I therefore prevail on my right honourable friend, who may have just a little bit more time in his hands? Uh, to come and open the show on Monday and encourage all other ministers to attend. Yeah. Prime Minister. I, uh, I think I'm one of the first Prime Ministers in a while to attend the Farnborough Air Show, and I'm very happy to announce that I will be going back there this year because I think it's very important. We have, I think, the second largest aerospace industry in the world after the United States, and it is a brilliant moment to showcase that industry to the rest of the world and to clinch some important export deals, both in the military and in the civilian space. And I would always do everything. I can, whether in this job or in future, to help support British industry in that way. Alison Fulis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights have recently joined the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in expressing serious concerns about this Tory government's brutal welfare cuts. How much more international condemnation will it take before this Prime Minister scraps his regressive two-child policy and scraps his rape clause? Prime Minister. What we've seen under this government is actually many more people in work, many more households, uh, many fewer households where no one works, and many few households many fewer households where there are children where no one works. All of those has been a huge success. But of course, she has the opportunity and her party now has the opportunity. Now we've made some huge devolution proposals, including in the area of welfare. If you don't think that what we're doing on a UK basis... I don't know why you're all shouting. You're getting these powers. Instead of whinging endlessly, you ought to be starting to use them. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Sir John Chilcott finds that the only people who come out of the 2003 uh, invasion of Iraq uh, well are servicemen and civilians. Will the Prime Minister look at, uh, at how he can make sure that the precedent he set last autumn for transparency and scrutiny ahead of military action becomes the norm for his successor? Well, I think we have now got um, a set of arrangements and also a set of conventions that put the country uh, in a stronger position. I think it is now a clear convention that we have a vote in this House, which of course we did on Iraq before premeditated military action. But I think it's also important that we have a properly constituted National Security Council, proper receipt of legal advice, uh, a summary of that legal advice provided to the House of Commons, as we did uh, both in the case uh, of Libya and Iraq. And I think these things are growing up to be a set of conventions that will work for our country. But let me repeat again, even the best rules and conventions in the world doesn't mean that you're always going to be confronted by easy decisions or, or ones that don't have very difficult consequences. Margaret Ferrier. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will no doubt be aware of my constituent, Pauline Cafferkey, a nurse who contracted Ebola in Sierra Leone in 2014, when there is part of the DFID organised response to the outbreak. She and around 200 other NHS volunteers through UK Med have not received an equivalent bonus of £4,000 oh that was awarded to 250 Public Health England staff. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with me yeah. to discuss <laughs> how DFID can rectify this situation? Yeah. Yeah. I'm very pleased that the Honourable Lady raises this issue because Pauline McCaffrey is one of the bravest people I've ever met and it was a great privilege to have her come to number 10 Downing Street and also I'm proud of the fact that she and many others I believe have received the medal for working in um, Sierra Leone which is something Britain should be incredibly proud of. We took the decision to help partner with that country to deal with Ebola and it is now Ebola free. I'll look specifically into the issue of the bonus. I wasn't aware of that issue uh, and I will get back to her about it. Order.